the kitchen doing all kinds of stuff. She finally had to come in there and shake my leg to get me to wake up. And I came up off of that bed like a cat on a hot tin roof. I said, what time is it? She says, you're late. You've got to get up. Oh, my goodness. I wish they would just leave it here. How about you? Oh, my goodness. Today is an amazing story that is so full of so many things. It's a little bit hard for me to talk about all of it. First of all, this lady at the well that we read about earlier in the gospel and all the details that are going on around all of this is one of the most amazing stories in the entire gospel. Let me tell you why. There is nobody in the gospels that had a recorded conversation as long as the one that this lady had, the Samaritan woman at the well, with Jesus. And nobody Jesus conversed back with that is recorded that had this kind or this length of, of a conversation. It is an amazing conversation on many, many levels. Some of it goes right over our head because our culture is very different than their culture. Part of the issues that we deal with when we read the scriptures is we have a misunderstanding of the culture of that day and time. This week in the United States was a, a week and there was a day when we honored the international uh, 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 honoring of, of women and there were several women that uh, the president honored and there was one person there that was trying to be a woman who he honored as well. That saddens me because there are some amazing women in this world. And I, I hate that that happened. Interesting to me, one of the largest banks in the United States of America went belly up this very week. And they are major promoters of woke. And as the saying is out there, you go woke, you go broke. This lady is not what we think about her. It says in John, the fourth chapter, this lady of Samaria, she's there at the well, Jacob's well, verse number seven. She'd come down to draw water. And Jesus said, hey, can you give me a drink of water? And she goes on and she and she says, well, you know, you're a Jew. You're talking to me, a Samaritan woman. She's in shock, number one. And she goes on to say, how can you ask me for a drink? Here's one of those things that goes over our head. Jews, get this, despised half-breed Samaritans. They despised them publicly. They would spit at them. They hated the Samaritans. Now, this lady's astute enough to know that, that this man who's talking to her is a Jew. And she is stunned that he would ask her for a drink of water. Jesus answered her in verse number 10. This is a stunning statement. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He still doesn't get it. He says, wait a minute, sir. You don't have anything to, you don't have a bucket here with you. You don't have any way to go down into that well. It's very deep. And where in the world do you get this living water from? By the way, you know, Jacob is the one who built, who built this well here. And he and his sons and his family watered their flocks and their livestock here. Jesus answered her in verse number 13. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Then he goes on and he says these words. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting, eternal life. Well, she's a smart lady, so she says in verse number 15, 
Oh, give me a drink of this water. I, give me some of this water that I may not thirst nor come back here to get water again. Jesus says to her then in verse number 16, go call your husband and come here. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And he says back to her, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. I'm telling you that the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. Reading that, you and I might think this was something of a loose woman. But there's things going on again in their culture that this passes right over our heads. One of the things is this. Women in that day and time had no right. Listen to me, ladies. In that day and time, you had no rights. Children probably had more rights than you, and they didn't have much. The only right you had socially and economically was to be tied to your father or to be tied to your husband. If you were not tied legally to a father or to a husband, you had no way to make a living. And generally what happened is it would force women into prostitution. This lady has had five husbands, probably in that day and time because they married young girls very early in arranged marriages. She had either outlived several of those husbands or had gone through a divorce with several of those husbands. Now I can tell you something about the conversation this lady is having with Jesus. She is sharp as a tack. She is a sharp woman. She is brilliant. She's theologically astute for somebody in her day and time. She is paying attention. There is every possibility that this woman is, an, is a businesswoman and is an entrepreneur. Have you ever seen a really strong woman who's a really strong entrepreneur? I have. They can just out, they can run circles around some of their husbands. I can imagine that's what's going on here with this woman. And in fact, it is what the ancient Orthodox Church says about her. It never says that she is a loose woman. And she says back to him in verse number 17, she's spiritually astute here. She says, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where you're going to have to worship. So not only is she sharp, look at this conversation she's having with Jesus. She's already entering in to a theological debate with somebody that said to her, I can give you living water, and by the way, you're not married. You've been married five times. He's told her things that only a prophet could know. And then she immediately starts the theological debate that exists between Samaritans and Jews. Jesus says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither, you, when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will we be worshiping the Father. Going on, it says, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Going on then, but the hour is coming. It's right now, lady, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. And this lady goes on and she says these words, or Jesus says these words. Well, she, she says, I know that, you're, that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. Now, I'm going to stop there again. I'm, giving you, I'm trying to give you a lot of history. This is going, going to really impact you. The Samaritans knew about Deuteronomy chapter 18, number, verse number 15, that says, where Moses says, another prophet like me, God will raise up. And when he gets here, I want you to worship, I want you to listen to him. 
he knew the Messiah was coming. The Jews, who were more in touch with the Davidic lineage of the Messiah, were looking for a king to come and overthrow the oppressing government of Rome and set up his kingdom upon the earth. That was their view of the Messiah. The Samaritans actually had a correct view of the coming of the Messiah, and they weren't thinking about him coming in the Davidic line. They knew that he was coming to save the human race. He will tell us all things. Going on to the next verse, it says these words. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am him. Can you imagine? She has engaged in this conversation with this man. He's telling her, I'm going to give you living water that will be a, a, a fountain of life springing up inside of you. And, and she says, well, you don't have a bucket. How are you going to get this water? And he tells her all kinds of things prophetically. And he says to her, the one who is speaking to you is the one you're talking about. I am the Messiah. You know, this woman is brilliant. She's smart. She's theologically and socially skilled. She's probably an entrepreneur. And because of the social structures, she had to be tied to a man. And Jesus is telling her, notice this. If, if, in, in the ancient world, when you went in a delegation to a city, you didn't just go to anybody. You went to the highest authority of that city and introduced yourself. Notice this also about this woman. She leaves her bucket of water and she says in verse number 29, to the city and the town. In other words, if she was a prostitute, nobody would have taken her seriously. She comes back into town. I'm thinking she is an entrepreneur. She's a strong businesswoman. She walks back into town, and people are listening to her, and she said, hey, you've got to come see this man who told me everything about me. Is this the Christ? And the whole town came out. Now tell me, does she have credibility or not? You better believe she's got some credibility. She is no prostitute. Many of the Samaritans come out in verse 39 and 40. They come, Jesus stays for several days. And now they're saying to her in verse number 42, hey, we don't just believe it now because you said it. We've heard him himself. We know that this man is the Savior of the world who comes to give us living water. What is living water? The Apostle Paul describes it for us in our reading today in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through, therefore, through whom, through whom also we have access by faith Notice this, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You and I have got to be crystal clear about that theological word called grace. The word grace is not the mercy of God. It is merciful that God gives us grace. But the grace of God is the supernatural enablement that God gives to us so that we can please Him and serve Him in a proper way. It is the ability of God within us. It is the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, as it says in this chapter in verse number 5. There it says to us these words. And hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by who? The Holy Spirit 
who was given to us. What is grace? It is the outpouring of the love of God inside of us that is not disappointing on any given level. It is a wellspring of life that springs up inside of us. It gives us an eternal hope. It gives us an eternal connection with the living Son of the living God. Gives us a little bit different picture. Jesus sat down at that well after a long journey. The disciples go off into town to get something to eat. They're going to bring him back a water burger. He's sitting there conversing with this woman. They can't believe it when they get back. He converts this woman. She goes and brings the whole town to him. And Jesus said, I am thirsty. <laughs> he wasn't thirsty for water. He was thirsty for their lives to be connected to him. He was thirsting to win those despised people called Samaritans. He was thirsty and hungry to know them intimately and personally. He was thirsty for them to be in a living relationship with him. Hmm. What was she thirsty for? She thought she was thirsty for water. It's unfortunate that in our blindness to the living God, in his eternal, uncreated light that fills everything and is everywhere. We can't see that. It's unfortunate because we have many God substitutes. We are thirsty and hungry people. We are born thirsty and hungry. We are thirsty and hungry all of our life. Because there is a great big hole inside of us that only the love of God and the blessed Holy Spirit can fill. And Jesus is thirsty and hungry that you allow that to happen in your life. Just like he was this despised Samaritan woman and the whole town that was despised. He was hungry and thirsty for a living relationship with them. And she, like us, have many God substitutes. We try to fill that empty hole with so many different things. And we walk away empty. Every time. Ultimately, my real hunger, my real thirst is for God. That's why we practice Lent. So that when we feel those moments of hunger or those desires for things that we have given up, we stop and we say, Lord, I'm really hungry and thirsty for you. I just don't know. Jesus Christ is the lover of mankind. In a way, you and I can never get our minds around. The devil gets a, gives us every excuse and rationale. It is unbelievable what a liar he is. Jesus thirsts for you. The creator of heaven and earth, how much he loves you. I'm blown away by it to this day. I'm still moved to tears by it. Are you trying to fill something in your life with something other than God? 
and this great love of God, this blessed love of God that's poured out in our hearts by the wellspring of the third person of the Trinity, the blessed Holy Spirit himself, which is the everlasting fountain inside of us. That love is what you're really hungry for. You're running away from it. This is the day to stop. This is the day to let the spirit of the living God arrest you. Just like he did that Samaritan woman. To capture your heart and to see his great, great love. My dear friends, I commend you to this great love today. And the rest of the story is, this lady has a name. Her name is Fotini. The Greek Orthodox Church has kept her history. She is known as the mother of all evangelists. So great was her gift of evangelism that Jesus gave to her in that conversation that she became nearly equal to the apostles in the number of people and cities she won to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the end, her and her sons were told by Jesus that she had to go to Rome and witness to the biggest antichrist of their day and time. His name was Caesar, Nero Caesar. And as a matter of fact, his name written out numerically is 666. After Caesar had tortured brutally her sons in front of her and murdered them, then he tortured her, trying to get her to renounce that fountain of living life inside of her. She finally looked at him and spit in his face you gotta, you got to realize this. Nero thought he was a king. She spit in his face and she said, you foolish man. You've killed my sons. You've brutalized me. And you have got, not gotten me to renounce Christ yet. And I will never renounce him. You foolish man. You're going to meet him someday. You know what they did to Fatini? They threw her into a well. It was a dry well, but they did not realize inside of her was a fountain of living water that would never dry out even to her last breath. And she has been given a martyr's crown along with her sons. And she is one of the great martyrs of ancient Christianity and a great woman of God. So sad. This week, our president honored somebody trying to be a woman who was not a woman. He was a man. God have mercy upon our soul. And for our president and for our Congress, and for our Senate, and for our judiciary around the world and around this nation, may you encounter this living, loving, incredible, passionate love of God who thirsts for you to this very moment, reaches out to all of us, no matter where we are, no matter how far we have strayed away. Say this with me, Jesus, I thirst for you thirst for you, Lord. Fill up my thirsty soul with you. We march toward Easter, Lord. Fill us with your great love. We're so blinded to it, Lord. We're so blinded. Help me to realize that all of my desires and my thirsts, my hunger is really toward you. And help me to see that the creator of heaven and earth thirsts to be in a living relationship with me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.